Well, this evening we're going to be answering the question, what does it really mean when we say that Christ is Lord of our life? That's something that we say quite often. It just kind of rolls right off of our tongues. But, but what does it really mean? Uh, and in order to answer that question, we're going to be turning to the book of Titus. Titus is a short little letter that Paul wrote to Titus. Uh, it's in a section of the Bible called the Pastoral Epistles. There are different kinds of epistles or letters that, that are written in the Bible. And, and these pastoral epistles are ones that Paul wrote to uh, Timothy and to Titus and to others to, to guide them as these men guided God's people. So this is Paul's advice on, on how to lead God's people. And so we see in this uh, letter to Titus uh, how Titus is to uh, bring some order uh, and discipline to the Cretan society that he lived in, and, and as these churches are being set up, what he must do. Uh, and it comes in a section where Paul is teaching on doing good for the sake of the gospel. And so we're going to pick it up on, on our rationale for, for living uh, good lives, uh, out of gratitude to God, of course, uh, for the grace that he's given to us. And we're going to read verses 11 through 15. Verses 11. Actually, we're going to read through just through 14. 11 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for that blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify us for himself as a people that are his, his very own, eager to do what is good. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we're grateful for your word to us. We pray that as we consider it for a little while, that you will help us to really understand what it is that we mean when we say that you are our Lord. All this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to look at four different aspects this evening out of Titus, four different aspects where it shows us Christ's Lordship. And you'll see there on the left side of the screen that I've put the uh, passage in an outline format. For me, that's always a little bit easier to, to help wrap my head around it. Uh, and so uh, I've done that for you here tonight, too. And we're going to look at it verse by verse about how Christ's lordship uh, affects our life. Uh, first of all, in verse 11, Christ's lordship brings light into the world. It says, for the grace of God has appeared. Uh, you would know that original word appeared in the Greek language because it's epiphene. Uh, you say, I don't know that word. Uh, yes, you do. It's epiphany. That's where we get the word epiphany from. The grace of God has been an epiphany in our, in our lives. What that word actually literally means is that it's lit up the world around us so that we can see. Just like what we heard this morning when we heard that Jesus came to testify to the truth, uh, he's come to light up our lives, to light up our world so that we can actually see the truth of God once again. It says, for the grace of God has, has been made known, has been lit up, that offers salvation to all people. You say, well, we just went through the canons of Dort a while back, and didn't, didn't we find out that, that uh, atonement is limited, that it's only to the people that God has chosen and not to all people? What does Paul mean here when he says that God's grace offers salvation to all people? Well, don't read too much into that sentence. Let's actually read the words that are there. It offers salvation to all people. It doesn't say that God brings salvation to all people. It's just that that offer is proclaimed to all. Look at how Paul puts it here in Timothy, that, that, that God our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Okay, that's true. God does want all people to be saved. Now, in as things work out, the only people who actually take God up on this offer are the ones that God has chosen before time, who, who he's given his spirit to and opened their eyes to see the truth. However, that proclamation of salvation goes out to all people. We tell all people that you can be saved in Jesus Christ. Uh, we proclaim that to everyone. 
But remember, only those that God has regenerated, only those that God has made new again, actually come to that knowledge of truth because their eyes have been opened by God's grace. So Christ's lordship brings light to the world. Secondly, it trains us for godliness. It trains us for godliness. We see that in verse 12. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and, and the things that are going on in the world. Uh, it says no to, to living in ways that compromise the fact that we are image bearers of God. Right? We can't be image bearers of God who have been placed in Christ, like what we learned last week, Sunday evening, and then live in a way that doesn't reflect that. That's not living in the truth. That's obscuring the truth, uh, which we heard about this morning, in, in a different way, uh, by, by making ourselves more important to it, or worried about what we look like more than we're worried about the truth. No, we're not to, to, we're to say no to that, Paul says. Say no to that kind of ungodliness and worldly passion. And that's, that's exactly what, uh, what Pilate was doing ultimately, right? He was putting himself over and above the truth. He was letting his passion be the truth, what it was that he wanted. And we see that in our lives all of the time. We have this constant battle going on in our heads, whether we want to follow our passions, whether we want to make that our truth, or whether we want to remain on that rock of truth that God has placed us upon. Uh, and that battle goes on and on in our heads, and we need to say no to the temptations that pull us away from that truth. But then it says that, that, uh, that God's grace teaches us to live self-controlled, upright lives. Uh, that word teaches there is, is where we get the word pedagogical, pedagogically from. I can't even pronounce it properly, but, but a pedagogy, I still didn't pronounce it right, but I'm not going to try again. Uh, that's a big fancy word for just saying it's step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, it's, it's a picture of a, of a teacher coming alongside of a student and working through a problem step-by-step, -step, patiently and, and wisely giving advice. That's what God's grace does in our life. It, it comes alongside of us and step-by-step -step brings us closer and closer to a sanctified life, to being the saints that we've already been made. Uh, that's a lifelong process of, of God teaching us bit by bit. Uh, now, there's, there's a lesson there that, that we're to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, but, but that's something we do on our own. So often in, in world history, Christians especially, uh, we've not done such a good job uh, of this aspect. We're to worry about our own lives, not necessarily the lives of society, uh, it, 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 our, our concentration here has to be on, on bringing our own life in line with God's will. And so often we're so much more worried about how society is not reflecting God's law in this way or in that way. Uh, and we do different things to try and make society change. Uh, and those things can be good. I'm not saying they're bad all the time. We'll talk about that in a second. It's just that Paul is saying you're first priority has to be yourself, not slamming God's law down people who don't want it. Uh, we're actually not called to do that in the Bible. We're just called to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, not enforce God's law upon other people. But there's, see, there's a tension there. There's always a tension in this theology. As Paul wrote this to Titus, they lived in the Roman Empire, where you weren't going to change anything uh, as people like Paul and Titus. They weren't going to change the way the government worked. They weren't going to change the way that Roman society worked. Uh, and so they really had no civic voice. But see, you and I as Americans, we're, we're not in that situation. We live in a country and in a society where we can shape our culture, where we can shape our government, and we have that responsibility to do that. So you see, you have this tension uh, where on one hand, Paul's calling you, you to worry about your life, not about society around you. But yet when we look at it in a broader picture, Paul would say, well, yeah, you've been given responsibilities as Americans to, to, to shape your society. And so that tension always needs to be at work with you, working on your own life first, making sure it's self-controlled and upright and godly, and then extending that out to society in a way that, that teaches them wisely and gently, step by step, not cramming down uh, 
God's law on people who are going to be pushing back upon it. So positively uh, or negatively, we're told to, to say no to ungodliness, uh, but positively we're called to, to start with self-control. Kind of look at how that progression works there. We start with ourself, self-controlled. Then he moves on to living an upright life. So you are, in a sense, worried about your image. We, we talked about this morning about how worrying about our image too much sometimes obscures the truth. But we need to be worried about our image in such a way so that when other people see us, they see that we're upright, that, that we follow God's law, that, that we live according to the way that we've, to the truth that we've been created in. So we do want to worry about that image somewhat. Uh, but we just want to make sure that that image that we're living in is grounded in the truth, not, not in something that we're trying to manufacture along the way. So Paul says, worry about yourself first, be self-controlled, then worry about how you're being appeared, about how you appear to other people. And then finally, uh, you're living a godly life. We, we go from ourself to how we interact with other people to living before God. You can see how that progression plays itself out there in, in Paul's writing. We, we live godly lives that are spiritually disciplined. That's what the spiritual disciplines are all about. Now, don't miss that last little line there. You can see we're starting a whole new section in the outline. We say no to ungodliness. We live self-controlled lives. When do we do it? We live it right now, in this present age. We're not going to wait to start living this way until Christ finally comes back and, and sets up the kingdom of God on earth once again. Uh, no, we're to, to, to remember that the kingdom of God is in this world, but not of this world. And so right now we're living as citizens of the kingdom of God, right now in this present age. And godliness is not something that will occur after this life, but it starts right now. So Christ's lordship brings us into, it brings light into the world. It, it brings that epiphany into the world that, that shines uh, the light of truth, of God's truth on everything. Christ's lordship trains us for godliness. I guess these things come up every time like this, right? Uh, and it next in verse 13, it prepares us for Christ's return. Prepares us for Christ's return. It says, it says we're to start living this way in the present age, it ends at verse 12. But hey, remember, we've got this already not yet phenomenon going on. We're in this present age living as God's children, but there's more to realize yet. We're waiting for the blessed hope that's coming. Now, there's something that we're still looking forward to. We're always looking forward to the kingdom of God fully being in this world, to where it's in this world and of this world. It's not that way right now. We're in the, we're, we're in the kingdom of God as citizens right now, but, but we're not of this world. Now, the day will come where we're both of those things once again, when, when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ appears once again. Uh, how do you live that way? Well, I think John Calvin has probably given some of the best advice I've read on how to do this. Uh, he says, uh, and this is a huge paraphrase, but, but what he's saying is when you go out your door every morning, uh, and maybe now as you stay in your house every morning because we're all confined, but anyways, when you go and start a new day, you're praying two things at the same time. First of all, you're thanking God for this world that he's put you in, for all of the good blessings that it has, for the work that you're able to do in it, uh, for the way that you see God's truth because his grace has come and, and has made that truth appear once again. You're, you're thankful for all of those good things that are going on in the world right now. But at the same time, you're praying that Christ will return this afternoon or right away. We, we're thankful for what we have but we want Christ to return and bring all things back into the kingdom the way that he will. And so you've got, again, that tension that's going on when Christ is Lord of your life all of the time. Okay, It, it says that while we wait for this blessed hope, which is the appearing of the glory. Well, that's the second time we've seen that word appear. We saw it up there in verse 11, as well, the grace of God has appeared. Do you remember what that word was? It was epiphany. The grace of God has, has lit everything up. 
Well, guess what? There's more lighting that will occur. It's the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we've seen God's grace appear and light everything up. But what we're waiting for, that hope that we still have, is for his glory to return and light everything up. Again, we're in that already not yet phase. We've already seen God's grace and are fully included in it. But we're not yet fully realizing the glory of God that's to come. That's what we're waiting for. That's that blessed hope that we look forward to. And look at that last line. You've got to look at some grammar here. This is important. The glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how many people are being referred to in that last line? Is it to God the Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ? No, that's not the way that grammar reads, either in Greek or English. It's our great God and Savior. Who is our God and Savior? Jesus Christ. You see these, these, these of course, we know that the, that the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but you can hardly open a page of the New Testament and even lots of instances in the Old Testament where we're presented with a triune God, one God who is three persons. Uh, and here we see that Jesus is not just our Savior, but he's also our God. Jesus is fully God. It's just kind of cool the way that that shows up here. So, We've seen that uh, Christ's lordship brings light into this world, that it trains us for godliness, as we've been talking about so much, and that it prepares us for Christ's return. Finally, here this evening, we're going to see that Christ's lordship purifies us as his people. It purifies us as his people. Remember, this was the purpose that Jesus said he came back for, that or not that he came back for, that he came into the world for. The reason that he was born, we read that this morning in John 18, was so that he could testify to the truth, to open our eyes once again, to purify us as his people. And that's exactly what Paul says here in verse 14. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to, to, to open our eyes so that we could see the wickedness that we had brought ourselves into, and to, to bring us out of that wickedness, to purify for himself a people. So, therefore, he gave himself to free us from all wickedness. That's how the NIV puts it here. Free us from all wickedness. And that's a very good translation. Uh, but let me read to you what it would say literally. It says to free us from the law. Now, why does Paul, or why did the translators here go with the word wickedness when Paul wrote out the word nomos, the word law. Well, remember what else that Paul says about the law, that the, that the law really introduces sin into our lives, that the law is there for us to see our sin, to see our wickedness. And so that complies exactly with what Paul is telling us here, that, and what we read about in John this morning, that Jesus came to open our eyes to the truth, to open our eyes to how we are so wicked, but not just to, to make us feel bad about our wickedness, but rather to redeem us, to buy us back out of the wickedness that we had put ourselves into. And look what he does once he purifies us from that with wickedness. He doesn't just set us off and let us go again. No, he purifies for himself a people. Isn't that what we see all through Scripture from, from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the book of Revelation, but especially in the Old Testament where we see that God always had his chosen people. God is a covenant God, and as a covenant God, he always has covenant children. And that's exactly what Paul is referring to here. We're not set free just to be independent. No, we've been set free. We've been redeemed to be to be Christ's people, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, that last section begins, that are his very own. Uh, another way that we can translate it is, is the way that Peter put it uh, in his letter, that, that we are his special possession. The best thing that God has, the best thing that Jesus has is us. 
Isn't that remarkable? Doesn't that give you hope as we face this uncertain future that, hey, we're the best thing that God has. He's going to take care of us. We don't know what that's going to look like as, as things change so rapidly around us, but we do know that we are his special possession, that we are his very own people. And now look at that's got to have a reaction in us. Knowing that you're the best thing that God has, what should that do to you? It should make you eager. It should make you zealous to do good work. Right? So, so look at this progression that happens here. And, and, and I love the way this outline kind of works out. It just kind of moves its way over. Uh, the grace of God comes in and lights up our life. It offers salvation to all people. It changes the way that we live because it pulls us out of the ungodliness and wickedness. It reminds us to live in this present age. Don't just keep our heads down and, and wait for Christ to return. No, we're to be active now, but we're to be waiting for that blessed hope and to realize that you've been redeemed from wickedness and made into God's special possession, his people, the best thing that he has. So go out there now and do good things. That's exactly what Paul wanted Titus to, to teach to his people. Uh, this was on the island of Crete. Uh, and we know what kind of people came off of Crete. We still use that word. They were called Cretans, right? These were not top shelf people. Uh, they were very, very wicked people. And this is the advice that Paul gives the pastor that was sent out to them. And so if that worked in that Cretan society, it certainly is going to work in our American society, which has some of those elements in it, uh, but it does enjoy uh, a lot more blessing than what the Cretans did at this point. But the point is, is that you're, you're created to do good works. You're going to have opportunity to do lots of good works in these next coming days and weeks as your friends and your neighbors and your fellow church members are going to need help in one way or the other. We're just right on the verge of this thing now, right? Right now, uh, all that we've experienced, at least here in Worthington, has just been inconvenience, right? We can't go to this place because it's closed. We have to stay in our homes. We have to do this differently, that differently. It's just inconvenient for us at this point. But things are going to start to change over these next few weeks, and it's not going to happen as quickly as what we think. It's going to take long I'm afraid this is going to be a way of life for a while. But the opportunity that we have as God's church to be eager to do what is good is massive right now. It's really going to be the biggest opportunity uh, to, to really be the church of God, to, to, to really do these good things, the biggest opportunity that most of us will see in our life. Uh, and so let's be ready for that. Let's, let's build ourselves on that truth, that rock of truth, that we heard about this morning so that no matter what the storms do uh, around us, it's not going to knock us off of that truth. Uh, and let's be reminded that you've been redeemed to be God's special people, eager to do what is good. So let's move on now to, to look at how Christ's lordship is expressed in our catechism, which is what we're going through this year. Uh, first of all, let's let's remind ourselves once again, we've talked about this a little bit, but but what does it mean that uh, that Jesus is called God's only begotten son, when we also are God's children, right? And so why do we say that, that Jesus is God's only begotten son, when really we call ourselves all sons of God? Uh, what does that only begotten mean? It's, those are words that we don't really use other than in uh, the Apostles' Creed, but they're so important that we understand them. The answer, of course, is that Christ alone is the eternal, natural son of God. We, however, are adopted children of God. And many of you know people who are adopted, or maybe you're adopted yourself. Uh, and you've seen the best of those situations to where adopted children live side by side with biological children. And of course, the parents in those situations, they don't see those children any differently. Yeah, this one was with biological, and these ones were brought in through adoption, but they're still our children, those adopted parents, or adoptive parents would say. It's the same with us. Uh, Jesus is God's only begotten son, his only eternal and natural son. But we're his adopted children, and he doesn't see us any differently now, even though there's, there's uh, this difference in, uh, in our essence, I guess you would say. We're adopted by grace through Christ. Okay? That, that grace that came in and lights up the world that we heard about in Titus. Let's go on to the more important question. 
Oh, we got to go through all that in a second. Let's go to the more important question. Why do you call him our Lord? That's what we've been learning about tonight. Why do we call Jesus Lord? Well, it's because he didn't buy us with gold or silver, but he bought us with his own precious blood. Uh, that doesn't even compare in value to gold and silver. He set us free from the tyranny of the devil. Uh, we've talked about this several times over these last couple of weeks, that, that the devil uh, has got very limited powers. Right? He can, he can swipe at you, and he can snarl at you, and, and he can deceive you and, and, and do all of these different things or try to deceive you. But remember, he can't make you do anything. You've been set free from his tyranny. All he can do is just, is just tempt you. All he can do is try and scare you. But he can't do anything to you because you've been set free from his tyranny. You've been bought, body and soul, to be his very own. And it's important that we're reminded of that here tonight, that we've been bought, body and soul. He's not just going to take care of us spiritually through these next coming weeks and months. He's going to take care of us physically too. We belong to him in body and soul and in life and in death through our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we heard about God's providence this morning uh, as we came to him in prayer, realizing that he's in control of all things, that, that with his hands, as it were, he's got everything in his control and, and won't let anything happen to us that's outside of that control. So take comfort in that as we go on and face the road that lays ahead of us. Let's pray now and thank God for what we've learned tonight. Dear Father in heaven, once again, we're grateful for your words of salvation that we can read from the Bible. Lord, we thank you for the grace that's come into our lives, for the fact that that's lit up uh, uh, what was present or previously dark in our lives so that we can see what's right and wrong now. Uh, we thank you that we can see you and see what you have done for us. Uh, we thank you for saving us, for redeeming us from that life of wickedness. And Lord, we pray now that we would live as your special possession, as your people who have been purified to do good things. All this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.